Yeah. Okay. So good evening to all who are present. So on behalf of Indian Aerospace Science and Technology Association, I welcome all participants who have gathered here to hear this lecture by Dr. Vishal Verma. This is our eighth lecture, and we are trying our best to bring renowned experts working across the globe. for the benefit of indian aerosol community this lecture series provides a way for all of us to communicate with these experts who have earned their name by doing excellent research work it also gives us a good opportunity to learn update our knowledge and connect with each other which is basically the mandate of iista as well today in this series we are happy that dr vishal verma has agreed to join us to contribute towards our, our efforts today's talk is titled as oxidative and metoxicological properties of ambient fine particulate matter a perspective on the relative contribution of different emission sources this very relevant and interesting talk focuses on pm toxicity targeting better assessment of health effects dr verma is an associate professor at the university of illinois is urbana campaign and has made a mark in the research field by publishing impact publications contributing in several conferences seminars and giving invited talks at different forums i was just looking at his profile many of many of his articles have been published in reputed journals like esnt and esnt letters showing the importance of the work he is carrying out his broad research areas are energy water environment sustainability environmental engineering and science and societal risk and hazard mitigation so you can see that he is working in forefront on the uh, burning issues which our society right now needs Dr Verma is past chair of the health related aerosol working group at Triple AR and has earned numerous awards and recognition for his work including the NSF career award in 2019 honorable mention for the James J Morgan early career award from environmental science and technology journal UIC UIUC center for advanced study fellow 2021 to 22 and invited chair for special symposiums or session on air pollution and health in the annual Triple AR and AGU conferences there are other lot of things to tell about dr verma but it is better to now uh, hand over the session to dr verma for his interesting session dr verma please thank you so much manish for such a nice introduction i hope i will fulfill the the expectation uh, for this lecture and thanks again for the invitation uh, to for me to present my work and at such an honorable forum so um should i share my screen now Yes. Yes, please. Okay. okay. Let me just uh, make the slide show. Okay. Now Fine. everyone can see my screen, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. So as Manish and Neeraj might have mentioned, that the the topic of my talk is the oxidative potential, oxidative and toxicological properties of ambient fine particulate matter. Um. and in this talk i'm going to talk about the the relative contribution of different chemical components and the emission sources in the uh, oxidative and toxicological properties so um let uh, yeah um first of all i would like to acknowledge the uh, the funding agencies which have funded my work in the us so far uh, which includes us epa NSF has been the largest source of funding for of a research work, and to some extent, uh, this UIUC JGU UIUC Institute, uh, Swiss National Fund, uh, National Science Foundation, and IBM, and uh, my collaborators, um, which have spread across the world, um, including Nira Jastogi, Dr. Tripathi, and uh, here my postdoc advisor as well, and the wonderful group of students I have, you know, uh, got the opportunity to work so far. uh this is like an old picture like i think some of them have graduated and some new members have joined but i i couldn't get a uh like a like you know a group picture so far like you know the latest group picture um okay so this is the outline of my talk um i will first talk about uh, a brief background of of the ambient pm 2.5 toxicity and since oxidative potential or oxidative stress has been purported as one of the possible mechanism to explain this health effects of the mpn pm 2.5 i will talk about various methods to measure the oxidative potential uh, just a like you know brief background about that because there had been some confusion about which assay we should use what do them what do they tell 
And then I will actually move on to next topic, which is the role of PM composition. As you know that uh, ambient particles are not single component. They are basically the mixtures of different chemical species. So which component of the ambient particle is playing major role in the oxidative stress has been a topic of great research, which I will uh, uh, describe in uh, based on our research. And finally, I will move on to various emission sources, which is important from the policy perspective. For example, which emission source, like is it biomass burning? Is it uh, trash burning? Is it factories or is it vehicular emissions, which actually contribute more to the, to the health effects? Okay. Um, just uh, warming, warming you up, like, uh, you know, uh, air pollution has been, uh, has been the leading risk factor for the global mortality and global mortality, uh, morbidity. Um, as per the, uh, this Global Burden of Disease report published in 2019, air pollution, both outdoor and indoor, has was ranked uh, three, responsible for 6.67 uh, million deaths in the world, which contributes to uh, almost 12% of the global deaths. Now, the question is, how you know, how we, how do we come up with these numbers? Like, you know, that air pollution is actually killing so many people. I mean, that has been a burning question. And if you actually look closely into the global burden of disease report, um, there have been some, uh, sh like, you know, uh, limitation they, they themselves uh, point out. So just to give you a brief background that, you know, people, uh, the researchers conduct, you know, uh, large scale cohort studies or the, which we call the epidemiological studies. And some of these notable studies you might have heard, like Harvard Six Cities studies. And similarly, like, you know, I mean, that study was conducted in 1993. Um, but since then, there have been several, uh, you know, uh, cohort studies where people study these uh, deaths, you know, death rate in the uh, in, in humans and then link it with the statistical methods to the ambient air pollution. And based on that, they actually developed this global concentration mortality functions as shown in the the last uh, graph here like you know where you basically plot the um the the response like mortality as a function of the ambient pm 2.5 mass so these are mostly the statistical uh, based on the correlation studies okay um as you know that global uh, this uh, epidemiological studies are good in, at linking the exposure to the health endpoints they are not very good in, in defining the causative relationship, like in, in finding out the causal mechanism. And for that, we need to conduct the, the biomedical studies, or we, call, we, can call those, we can call those as the toxicological studies. Uh, uh, in the toxicological studies, we take up individual cells of the humans or uh, tissue or, you know, or the whole individual we expose. For example, we don't expose humans, but we expose animals, like, you know, and then we uh, basically expose them to the ambient particle and see the actual physiological effects occurring in the uh, in the body and gen like you know these toxicological studies were slower in uh, you know if you look at the chronology of the the uh, health effects literature we like the first step was the epidemiological studies and then they were followed by the toxicological stu studies uh, in which people started to find out what is the mechanism, like well, how these ambient particles are actually causing these health effects. And interestingly, in, in in most of all the studies, you know, which have been conducted, the one central mechanism which was found to be common among all those mechanisms was the, the oxidative stress. Uh, I mean, there could be other mechanisms also, but I think the oxidative stress was identified as the central mechanism, um, which was found to be responsible for the uh, the toxicological or the health effects of the ambient PM 2.5. So what is this oxidative stress? In simple plain language, oxidative is, def is defined as the stress caused by abundance of oxidants, or which are also called the reactive oxygen species or ROS in the body. Now, the question is how, how ambient particles are actually causing this abundance of the oxidants or the reactive oxygen species. And for that, We'll have to go a little bit uh, into the back into the basics. Like, is the ROS generation or the generation of the oxidants in the body a natural phenomena, or is it like foreign phenomena, or un completely unnatural? How do these particles, like you know, destroy this balance? So let's let's try to understand it a little bit from the basic uh, principles. Like, you know, uh, all of you might might know that what is aerobic respiration, right? In which we eat the food in the term, in the form of glucose. 
which is then oxidized by oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water and energy in the form of ATP molecules are released, right? Everyone probably knows this, this simple reaction. But the actual process, if you look at the high school biology, like in you know, a little bit more complicated, what happens, I, I, won't go in, I won't go into the details, but just briefly talk about it. Glucose first undergoes glycolysis to form pyruvate, um, which is then degraded to form acetyl coenzyme and carbon dioxide. So this is the carbon dioxide released here. Then acetyl coenzyme actually enters the mitochondria, which is called the powerhouse of the cell, where it is undergoes Krebs cycle. Now you might be under, like you know remembering the uh, you know the concepts you studied in the the tenth or eleventh uh, sorry eleventh class biology. And then um, I used to hate that by the way. <laughs> but um, so then acetyl coenzyme A undergoes this Krebs cycle. Um, the final product of this Krebs cycle is NADH and FADH two, which then undergoes this electron transport chain. Um, in which the electrons are basically transferred from one step to another. And at every step, there is a uh, like a fixed generation of the ATP molecules. The final molecule which accepts this, uh, uh, these electrons is oxygen, which in presence of uh, like hydrogen uh, ions, like you know, protons form water molecule. And so that's the complete reaction, right? Um, so we basically have this carb the generation of carbon dioxide, ATP and water molecules, right? But as you know that nothing in nature is absolutely perfect, so it's true with this process. What happens that in 0.1% of the cases, these electrons are prematurely accepted by oxygen and in absence of protons, it directly accepts this, these electrons and form this superoxide radical. So there is, there's no presence, if there is no presence of the, the protons, then it basically accepts one electron and gets reduced. And that's what we call the, the superoxide anion radical. And that's the first step in the generation of the reactive oxygen species. Once the superoxide radical is generated, which is actually an ROS, it forms by accepting more electrons, it actually can form hydrogen peroxide followed by the generation of the hydroxyl radical. So it basically initiates a series of this chain reaction in the body. So, um, so basically what we learned is that ROS generation is not a foreign phenomena or an unnatural process. In fact, as we are eating food, we are generating ROS. There is no way like, you know, ROS are needed. Like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know if they are needed or not, but yes, they, there is a continuous generation of ROS, even if, even if we are not exposed to the particles. So that means if ROS generation is a natural phenomena, then there must be a process. I mean, otherwise, like if there is no defense mechanism, then we will be killed by the ROS, right? Because they are very, very reactive species. They actually start oxidizing anything coming to their pathway. So, uh, the body has to develop some defense mechanism to protect itself from ROS. And there actually is a defense mechanism, which we call the antioxidant defense mechanism. All of our cells, almost all of our cells actually have a pool of ant chemicals called the antioxidants. Whose main purpose is to basically donate electrons. So whenever an ROS or a free radical is generated, which basically characterized by this lack of a free electron, like, you know, what does it, uh, you know, this antioxidant do? They actually... Uh, donate their electron to free radical and quench it. Like so, basically make it from change it from unstable to stable species. Uh, and we have abundance of these antioxidants. For example, vitamin C, glutathione, vitamin E. All these are antioxidants. Um, so the question is, what's the problem? Like you know, uh, we have the ROS, we have the antioxidants. In fact, there is no problem in a healthy individual. There's a very perfect balance between the concentration of reactive oxygen species and the concentration of antioxidants. The problem arises when this balance is disrupted. How? We have an abundance of ROS generation, which is higher than the, the capability of the antioxidants to, to support it. Or there could be other mechanism by which the antioxidant pool of the body is depleted. For example, if I have the lack, if I have deficiency of vitamin C, if I have deficiency of glutathione, then even the normal ROS generation, which is occurring in the body, cannot be supported. Both of these conditions are called the oxidative stress because basically we are having abundance of oxidants, which can be supported by the antioxidants. And ambient particles are notorious in creating this, in this imbalance between the ROS and the antioxidants. So how do these ambient particles actually cause this, this, this 
imbalance of the ROS and antioxidants. There could be several modes. Some of the particles, you know, they can carry actually the ROS right sitting on the board, on, on the on the particle surface. Uh, like maybe there could be hydroxyl radical, there could be superoxide radical, hydrogen peroxide already present, or the organic peroxide, which I think some of the uh, research groups in, in, in uh, you know, for example, uh, Manabu Shriyawa and so even Sujan Parson actually measured this concentration of the particle sitting, for concentration of the reactive oxygen species sitting on the particle itself. Uh, they can be directly inhaled and then cause this imbalance of the ROS and antioxidant. There could be other modes such as some of the part, some of the chemical components present in the particle, such as we know there are metals present in the particle, there are quinones. What they can do is they can take the electrons in presence of an electron donor, such as an antioxidant itself, and then transfer this electron to oxygen and generate this superoxide radical. So they they are they are these species are called the redox cycling species. Basically, they are cycling the they are transferring the electrons from electron donors and to to an oxygen uh, to to form the ROS. Um, so um, and basically generate this reactive oxygen species. So that is called the catalytic property of the particles or the redox cycling capability. There could be another mechanism which is more complicated, in which certain biological cells in our bodies, which are called the macrophages. Uh, these cells, when they come in the contact of a foreign substance, may, for example, you know, ambient particle is a foreign substance for them. They uh, identify them as something unnatural and they try to engulf it. Like, you know, they, they, they try to basically get rid of it. And in that process, they generate a lots of lots of reactive oxygen species, you know, as the signaling molecules to bring more cells, you know, to, to the site of action or the infection so that they can actually start, you know, start the clearing process. So these three mechanisms are the most important mode of uh, by which these ambient particles actually can generate reactive oxygen species. So um, now we understand, you know, some of these mechanism based on these mechanisms, you know, uh, there have been two assays which have been developed and uh, like, I mean, now there have been more assays developed, but like, you know, traditionally two major assays were developed, um, which basically captures these different modes of the oxidative potential. One assay is very common, very, very, very well known, which is called the DTT assay. What do we do is, uh, now we don't actually, none of these assays capture this first mode of the oxidative potential, which is the particle sitting on the, sorry, the RO sitting directly on the particle surface. Um, I mean, there are different methods to, to capture that, but um, uh, like, you know, I, I don't do work in, work in that area, although that could probably could be an important mode as well. Um, so how does DDT assay work? So here we take a electron donor, which is basically uh, uh, like a surrogate for the biological reductant called NADPH. And then we incubate this compound in presence of the aerosols. And what do this? What does this, you know, uh, aerosol do? This aerosol particle do? They, they actually take out the electron from the DTT and oxidize the DTT, right? You would, you take out the electron from the DTT, it becomes oxidized, right? And then they transfer this electron to oxygen, uh, which results in the generation of the superoxide radical. So as you can see, the process which we just described um, for the generation of the superoxide radical by NADPH in the body. This DTT assay actually simulates that process, uh, you know, in a chemical reaction in a test tube. So what do we do is, instead of measuring the superoxide radical, we measure the rate of generation, rate of generation of, uh, sorry, the rate of consumption of DTT. So rate of generation of oxidized DTT or the rate of consumption of DTT, right? So which is proportional to the rate of formation of the superoxide radical. Um, in the macrophage ROS assay or the cellular assay, so now this is a different assay, okay. Um, what do we do is we actually take red alveolar macrophage cells or now people have started taking other cells also such as human lung cell lines, you know, macrophages or epithelial cell lines and we incubate these, these cells. Uh, yeah, like we basically uh, in presence of a dye called the DCFH, you know, which is a non-fluorescent dye. And then we incubate this, these cells to uh, to ambient particles. Um, now these ambient particles penetrate in the, inside the cell and they generate this reactive oxygen species inside the cells. Now the, these cells contain the DCFH dye. Now this DCFH dye reacts with ROS and gets oxidized to DCH. 
This DCH is a fluorescent compound. So DCFH is not fluorescent, but DCH is fluorescent. So once it turns into fluorescent, the whole cell becomes like, you know, colored, like fluorescent. So what do we do is that by using a plate reader method or something, we count the number of these fluorescent cells, which is basically proportional to the rate of formation of the ROS. So these are the two major assays. Now there could be other mechanism of the ROS generation. As I told you that uh, this ROS formation is a sequential reaction, is a cascade of, uh, you know, re uh, reaction. So um, one caveat of the DTT assay is that as you see that, you know, that uh, oxygen by accepting electron forms superoxide radical, which actually can, in presence of another electron, it can form hydrogen peroxide. Now, if there's a, like a significant presence of iron or other metals such as copper, like, you know, these hydrogen peroxide actually can get converted into hydroxyl radical. Hydroxyl radical is, is probably like, you know, thousand times much faster, much reactive than the superoxide radical. Uh, meaning it could be mu much more toxic to the body. So if we just measure the DTT consumption, DTT consumption is basically proportional to this rate of superoxide radical formation as we just talked about, right? If we, may, if we limit ourselves only to the DTT consumption, we won't be able to capture the rate of formation of the hydroxyl radical uh, because it is dependent on the, form, on the presence of the iron, which is present in the body, also presents in the particle itself, right? So in 2017, we actually developed a new assay to measure the rate of formation of the uh, hydroxyl radical in the DTT assay. How do we do it? that we actually capture this hydroxyl radical by, by a compound called uh, disodium terephthalate, which is TPT. Uh, so we basically incubate that in presence of the DTT itself. Now this disodium terephthalate, TPT, actually reacts with hydroxyl radical to form this 2-hydroxy uh, terephthalic acid, which is a fluorescent compound, uh, which can be excited at 310 nanometer and excite, like, you know, emits the light, the wavelength, uh, light at, at a wavelength of 425 nanometer. Uh, so by measuring the fluorescence of that compound, we can basically measure the rate of formation of the hydroxyl radical. Um, so the point is that by measuring the consumption rate of both the DTT and the rate of formation of the hydroxyl radical, we can better capture the contribution of these different chemical species, such as both like quinones and metals in the DTT as itself. Okay, um, as I have been talking about this oxidative potential, like, you know, uh, you might be uh, asking this question, is this a relevant, biologi really biologically relevant me measure? And, uh, you know, I won't go into the details, but I like the, as of now, uh, there have been several epidemiological studies which have actually incorporated oxidative potential uh, in their designs. Uh, and what they have found, those epidemiological studies have found that most of these uh, endpoints of the oxidative potential, such as DTT assay, they are better able to explain the health effects um, than the PM 2.5 mass. So this, this just this one study, I, like how how uh, is that true? Like you know, I will just talk about this study which I, in which I was involved. So we basically measured the ray, this DTT activity of the particles in in Atlanta for a year for uh, one year of samples collected in, at the central Atlanta, Atlanta site. And then based on that one year of data, we backcasted the DTT activity for last 10 years from 1998 to 2009 using a source apportionment, source apportionment model. And then when we actually uh, linked it with the, uh, like the, the incidents or, uh, you know, the, um, the emergency departmental visits for asthma wheeze and congestive heart failure, what we found that both ROS activity, that the DTT activity and PM2.5 mass were actually related with the this emergency departmental visit for asthma wheeze and cardi congestive heart failure. Uh, like individually, they were both related. But when we put both of them together in the same model, the PM2.5 effect goes away, but the DTT activity still remains strongly associated. The point is that uh, this DTT activity is the central mechanism by which, like, you know, these, uh, uh, this emergency departmental visit for asthma, wheeze, and congestive heart failure was actually associated with the PM2.5. 
So we can say that ROS did a better job in predicting this relative risk of asthma which ends congestive heart failure than the PM2.5 mass. And since then, there have been many studies like, you know, epidemiological studies, cohort studies, or clinical studies, which have found a better association of the ROS activity in predicting a certain health endpoint than the PM2.5 mass. So that was from the epidemiological perspective, like, you know, the cohort, the human studies. In toxicological or the biomedical studies also, studies also there have been uh, like, you know, the oxidative potential or the ROS has shown a better linkage with the certain health endpoints, certain toxicological endpoints than the PM2.5 mass. For example, this study, which, uh, you know, like in which we collected this, <laughs> like uh, almost uh, like um, 250 samples from various sites in the Midwest US, such as Bonneville, Chicago, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Champaign, my hometown, like, you know, here. Um, we collected several samples and we measured the, the, uh, the, uh, the cell viability, which is basically like, you know, the, the, the cell death, the inverse of the cell death rate, you know, uh, um, in A549 cells, which is the human lung cell lines. Um, and we measured the cellular ROS response in those cells. And we found like, you know, uh, in, at all the sites, the cell viability was actually strongly related with the, the ROS generation. I mean, there's a negative correlation be, be, because cell viability is inverse of the cell, uh, uh, death rate, you know, so this is the work in preparation, like, um, and so this basically gave some idea, I mean, some evidence that ROS generation or the oxidative potential is a biologically relevant method. And very interestingly, like, you know, uh, recently we found out, we did a very interesting experiment. Let me just tell you, um, we actually treated these PM samples, uh, sorry, not the PM sample, we treated these cells, the A549 cells, the human lung cell lines, with the antioxidants such as glutathione, you know, and what did we do, do is we pre treated these cells and then after that we actually exposed them uh, to the same uh, samples, same PM samples collected from these different sites. And what we found that after treating with this antioxidants uh, GSH, which is a glutath which is glutathione, you know, we found that the ROS response was actually lesser in all of these cells, and uh, the cell viability was enhanced, meaning the cell death rate was actually lower after treating with the antioxidants. So if that means antioxidants is working and antioxidant is working basically means that uh, oxidative stress is the primary mechanism which was killing these cells. Because once we treated these cells with the, like it's like, it's like you know, kind of taking the supplements. Like, you know, if you take the supplements of the antioxidants, I'm not promoting that, but uh, basically at the point I'm saying that if you actually somehow like, you know, um, like supplement these cells, specific these uh, uh, specific CO cells, then they are better able to cope up with the air pollution, like, you know, or the ambient particles. Uh, and that shows that oxidative stress is the primary mechanism of killing these cells. Now let's switch gear to what is the role of diff different com PM components in the oxidative potential. Um, and um, so I would just talk about our overall approach here. How do we do it? Actually, we collect the ambient particles from different sources, including primary particles directly from coming from the exhaust tail pipe of the vehicles. Secondary particles, which, you know, as, as you know, these primary particles get oxidized in the atmosphere to form the secondary particles. And then some of the sources which are very prominent in, in US, such as biomass burning. And we collect these particles from all these different sources and measure the rate of ROS generation by different assays and also measure the uh, these chemical components of the of these particles like you know and by using this different regression and machine learning uh, tools we basically link the ROS generation by this chemical composition so that is a statistical approach but we also try to take the mechanistic approach in which we actually break these particles into different chemical species, such as elemental carbon. We can remove the elemental carbon, inorganics, organics, and metals, like, you know, and then measure the ROS activity of these different species separately. So like, basically we, we take out one substance and then measure the residual ROS activity. Then we take out another substance, measure the residual ROS activity. So by basically using this successive elimination technique, we, may, we see how much ROS activity is actually associated 
uh, with a specific chemical components. So that's one approach, like you know, which we can call the the uh, the the uh, the down uh, approach, you know, or the top down approach. And the other approach could be top up approach, where basically we take the specific chemical component of the the particles. Uh, which are available commercially, such as ammonium sulfate, black carbon, specific chemicals such as you know quinones, pHs, and metals, and we measure the ROS active intrinsic ROS activity, the mass normalized ROS activity of these different species, uh, and we know that these species, if we sum them up, they basically make the ambient particle. So we multiply the intrinsic ROS activity with the mass concentration of the sub these substances present in the particle, and then. By multiplying it, we basically get get the total contribution of these different chemical species, right? In the overall R was activity of the particle. So we have a, we basically used both of these approaches in our in our research work. <coughs> and to measure the R was activity of these different sub, like you know substances particles, we have developed a series of um, you know automated and high throughput instrument. Um, I won't talk about this, but just to give you like, you know, a snapshot of the different instrument we have in our lab to basically measure these different modes of the ROS activity present in the particles, like, you know. Um, so what we have found so far in, from based on this analysis, um, early on from my previous, like, you know, my research, my PhD research, we I found that uh, the DTT assay, the acellular mode of R ROS generation, was strongly correlated with the organic substance. As you can see from the statistical correlation, it was a strong function of the water-soluble organic carbon or the organic compounds we can call. While the macrophage ROS generation, the cellular method of measuring the ROS generation was strongly correlated with the specific metals such as iron, cobalt, and chromium. Now, again, this was statistical correlation to confirm that these are actually the species which are driving the ROS generation. We did some mechanistic approach in which we remove these different specific compounds, like, you know, but for example, I use this thermodenator, which heats the aerosol, as you, as you know, that organic com compounds are sensitive to the heat. After heating, they become volatilized and get removed. Aerosols, we found a substantial drop in the ROS, the, 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 the DTT activity. To remove the metals, we used a chelation technique in which we pass the aerosol extract through a chelation column, which, abs which uh, like, absorb these metals onto the column. So what we have coming out from the Kelex column is a metal-free aerosol mixture. And we found that after removing the metals from the mixtures, from the matrix, there's a substantial drop removal of the ROS activity. So basically, by using this statistical and uh, mechanistic approach, we can say that DTT activity was mostly driven by the organic compounds and the macrophage ROS activity was mostly driven by the metals. Uh, but later on, that research was not like was like you know shown to be somewhat uh, flawed uh, because there was a group at UC Davis which which used a different approach in which they found they actually took up these specific metals like you know copper, manganese, and different different compounds, um, and they measured the intrinsic ROS activity of the particles like you know intrinsic activity of these different species. And they found actually copper has a substantial DTT activity. It's even higher than the the uh, the, the finance, this specific organic compounds such as quinones, you know. And based on the concentration of the metals present in the PM, they found that actually copper contributes substantially to the DTT activity of the particles. So this is hypothetical PM mixture they prepared, and they found that the copper actually is playing a major role in the DTT activity. I mean, even they, 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 there was some flaw in that research also, which I will talk maybe later about it because it's a hypothetical mixture. Um, but let's just, you know, move on to the uh, to a different topic. Like, okay, we found that organic compounds are also playing a major role in the, in the DTT activity and maybe metals also based on the research from UC Davis. Now, the question is, this organic compounds are a bulk species. Like, you know, there's a group of compounds. What is the specific compound in the organic carbon which is basically contributing to the ROS activity? I mean, the organic compounds are coming from biomass burning, they're coming from cooking, they're coming from vehicles. Which organic compound coming from which source is actually contributing to the DTT activity? So that was the question I was having in my mind when I conducted my research at uh, during my postdoc. And um, 
So to address that question, we use this uh, instrument, uh, high resolution aerosol mass spectrometer, which speciate this organic aerosol into different classes of the organic compounds, such as hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol, isoprene organic aerosol, biomass burning, oxidized, which is the SOA, like, you know, and the cooking organic aerosol. And we measure the DTT activity of the particles using a high volume filter. And then we related it with the, uh, like these different specific species, uh, the, the different organic aerosol with the, with the ROS activity. And based on that, we developed a multiple linear regression model to predict the, the, the DTT activity of the particle as a function of these different uh, organic aerosol. And um, the interesting this thing about this equation is, if that uh, the unit of the DTT activity is in nanomole per minute per meter cube of air, uh, and the unit of this organic aerosol is in like, you know, microgram per meter cube of air, then the units of this coefficient is in ROS generation of the DTT activity per microgram of aer aerosol, right? Which is basically the mass normalized or the intrinsic potential of this organic aerosol to generate ROS, right? And this is what I calculated and is shown here. Um, as you can see that biomass burning organic aerosol was shown to be very efficient in generating the ROS, uh, like it was having the highest potential, uh, highest intrinsic DTT activity potential followed by cooking organic aerosol and oxidized organic aerosol. So basically we see that these, and we know that this biomass burning organic aerosol contains a, com, uh, contains a specific class of compounds called the Hewlis or which is also called the humic like substances, which is basically basically the aromatic substance of the particles, like, you know, aromatic organic substances. So um, now uh, using a similar approach, like, you know, this, so this was based on the DTT activity. Now, um, what are the chemical, what are the specific species? What are the specific uh, components of the particles which are uh, responsible for the cellular ROS generation? Um, we also measure the, the cellular ROS generation caused by this different specific, uh, species, species of the, the PM, such as metals, organic compounds, quinones and pHs, and inorganic substances. And as you can see, that the metals such as iron, manganese, and copper actually dominated the cellular OP, you know, um, measured the macrophage ROS assay, uh, followed by quinones. And so this is this dissimilarity between this, the contribution of these different uh, PM components into a cellular versus cellular method of ROS generation. But overall, we can say that organic compounds uh, characterized by this aromatic substances and the metals are the major species which are responsible for the ROS generation in the um, in the cells. Okay, now the caveat in this research is, so far we have been talking about this specific individual role of these organic compounds and metals. The question is, do these species interact with each other? Meaning, if they interact, there could be synergistic interaction, there could be antagonistic, or there could be additive like effects, right? Um, so what is it, the nature of interaction? Because if there is a nature, if there is a synergistic or a antagonistic interaction, that means we can't, we cannot talk about the uh, these the contribution of these species species individually. They have to work in tandem. And that's the first data set we actually generated in from our lab. We found that there are both synergistic and antagonistic interaction among uh, these species for the uh, for this uh, you know oxidative potential assays such as like DTT assay in which we basically measure the rate of consumption of DTT and the OH generation in DTT. We found that metals and uh, uh, like you know copper actually has a antagonistic interaction so this is the the individual ROS activity and this is the, the activity of the mixture. As you can see, this is act the mixture activity is lower in most cases. So copper has a antagonistic interaction with the DTT assay. In the DTT assay, magnesium has somewhat synergistic effect, and iron has mostly additive effect, but not in the hydroxyl radical. In the hydroxyl radical, these are like uh, copper and magnesium have antagonistic interaction, but iron actually has synergistic interaction. And the similar effect we saw with, when we made the mixture of Hewlis, humic type substances, and these metals. 
in which we saw iron has a strong synergistic effect with the uh, with these organic compounds. So what is the mechanism of this interaction? I think it's, 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 uh, there could be many mechanisms. One mechanism which we proposed is that these antioxidants actually are able to, uh, like, you know, screen nodes are able to take the, uh, the electrons from antioxidants and then, then generate this hydrogen peroxide. Now this hydrogen peroxide is then reduced by iron to form this hydroxyl radical. So when there's a presence of both quinones and iron, we see a strong synergistic effect of the hydroxyl radical. That's the one mechanism which we propose. There could be other mechanism also, which I will talk uh, in, in a minute. But the point here is that the similar type of interaction effect we saw, not only in the acellular method, which is the DTT assay, but also in the cellular method. For example, here we took up a cell, like, you know, um, and when we measured, the LC50, which is basically the lethal concentration, which kills 50% of the cell. So remember, lower is the LC50, more toxic is the sample. And then uh, we measure the LC50 of a compound, let's say Hewlis, and then then we incub then we expose this cell to the non-toxic level of this metals, because if there's a toxic, if it is a tox toxic level, then you know LC50 cannot be added. So when we added uh, this incubated, this again with the non-toxic level of the metal, we saw if there is a decrease in the LC50. If there's a decrease, that means there's a synergistic interaction. If there's an increase, that means there's an antagonistic interaction. And we found that LC50 actually reduces whenever this hudis was mixed with these different metals, like, you know, meaning there's a synergistic effect for with most of these metals. There could be other mechanism of the PM, of the interaction of the PM components. For example, uh, you know, we published a paper in 2017 in which we found that certain species such as sulfate actually can enhance the acidity of the aerosol and then making the metal more solubilized and like, and thus incorporating its effect in the RO generation. Another, another effect could be that some of these metals can be complexed by these organic compounds. And then this complexation actually enhances the solubility of these metals and thus making this metal more available or more active in the, in the oxidative potential assay. Okay, I will actually skip these slides in the interest, interest of time because so basically here we, we showed the evidence for the this second effect for the complexation of the metals by organic compounds. Um, actually, I would like to switch gear and then uh, like, you know, to the emission sources of the oxidative potential of the particles, like, you know, uh, what have been the major emission sources uh, responsible for the oxidative potential. But before that, like, you know, why do we worry about the emission sources? I would show you briefly about why do we worry about that? The question is, if, if PM2.5 mass and ROS activity vary together, then we, we, won't, we shouldn't be looking for the emission sources of PM mass versus ROS activity. The same emission sources which is contributing to the mass should be contributing to the ROS activity. But if they don't vary together, then what does that mean? That the emission sources which are contributing to the, to the PM mass could be very different than which are contributing to the, to the toxicity or the ROS activity, right? So we actually tested that. Do, do they vary together? And uh, we have collected the data from several sites in the world in which, you know, uh, Professor Rastogi has been my collaborator and including Professor the party uh, and you know and various collaborators across the world. Uh, we get the, the samples from several sites in the world and uh, measure the ROS activity by different assays. Like you know, uh, like you know, name the assay. We, name the assay. We actually measured the ROS activity, and we found that this ROS activity was actually like very linearly with the PM two point five mass at most of the sites, but the slope is different at different sites. Okay, and um, how do we, like we can see the slope is different, but uh, when we actually plot all this data together, like, you know, we found that a non-linear curve, a supralinear curve actually better explains this, the, the response of this oxidative potential with the PM2.5 mass than, than a linear relationship. And interestingly, this is very similar to the to the supralinear curve, which was found by uh, the Scott Wichenthal group at, uh, at McGill University, in which they actually measured the relative risk uh, of mortality from PM2.5 mass. So they basically found at higher concentration, the, the response become plateaued. 
at lower concentration it's very sharp so very similar curve as we found in our dtt in our oxidative potential uh you know they found in in their mortality uh curve function uh with the pm 2.5 mass so basically, uh, so we know that there is a nonlinear relationship between the PM two point five mass and ROS receptivity, and uh, which actually you know like motivated us to bring our instrument to like various parts of the the world. And you know, for example, if we brought this online uh, DTT activity instrument in two thousand nineteen to India, in which uh, in collaboration with Professor Tripathi and Professor Rastogi, we measured the uh, the DTT activity, the first measurement of the online measurement of the DTT activity of the particles in India uh, in real time manner. I mean, there have been measurement of the oxidative potential by Professor Astori group uh, using filter based method, but this was the, the online method uh, measurement. And they found that the DTT activity uh, again varied nonlinearly, meaning uh, the PM 2.5 mass in Delhi was 13 times higher than in, a, than in Illinois, typical ambient site in Illinois, but the DTT activity was only five times higher meaning there is a non-proportional relationship between PM mass and oxidative potential. With the success of that instrument, we actually brought our instrument like in again uh, in 2020, uh, uh, in which we conducted a larger campaign, uh, we, which was more geared towards finding out the emission sources, like, you know, contributing to the oxidative potential. And we found that uh, in different seasons, the emission sources vary. For example, in the post-monsoon season, we found that uh, secondary sulfate, and traffic was a major contribution contributing to the DTT activity. But during Diwali, fireworks became the major major source. And then in the winter fog, it was a biomass burning, like you know, which was contributing more to the DTT activity of the particle. And remember that the previous source apportionment studies, which have been conducted using the, on the PM 2.5 mass, meaning the sources which are contributing more to the PM 2.5 mass, uh, there's a dissimilarity in the profiles. For example, biomass burning was shown to be contributing only to, to 6 to 25%, you know, to the to the PM 2.5 mass in comparison to 34%, which is like, you know, for the DTT activity. Similarly, secondary sulfate was contributing only to 15% of the PM 2.5 mass. But in our study, we see uh, a strong contribution of, uh, uh, of secondary sulfate in all seasons, like, you know, uh, like 30, 38 to like 35%. And similar results we saw in Midwest uh, same, uh, campaign also that um, like secondary sulfate and nitrate were the major sources contributing to the PM 2.5 mass uh, followed by biomass burning and cool combustion. But the sources which were contributing to the cellular opioid particles were secondary organic aerosol, agricultural activity surprisingly like you know in the rural sites and dust like you know in the roadside sites. So with that, I will conclude my slides that the emission sources which are contributing to the PM 2.5 mass are not necessarily the same as those contributing to the health effects. So we should do the source apportionment study both based on the PM 2.5 mass and the health effects or like, you know, or the toxicity of the particles. Using globally generalized linear concentration response functions, can lead to the unrealistic estimation of the mort morbidity and mortality in countries such as India, China, you know, or other like, you know, highly polluted countries. Be because the, be why? Because the, uh, these response functions are not linear. They are non-linear, meaning they become plated at higher concentration. Now then what should we do? Like we don't have this response function for the, for these countries, right? I mean, most of these cohort studies were conducted in, in US or Europe, right? So there have been, like I suggest two options for that. Either we should develop this region specific concentration response curve by conducting these cohort studies in countries like India. Uh, but the question is, these studies are prospective. Like, you know, they take years to develop. Do we have time for this? Yes, but like, you know, they might take years, like, you know, decade to actually develop this response function. Till then, what should we do? I suggest that we should actually modify this response function using the intrinsic toxicity of the PM 2.5. And uh, for, you know, intrinsic toxicity, meaning uh, like what is the, the, the toxicity of the particles per mass basis, right? And what measure should we do? I think oxidative potential could serve as a proxy for this intrinsic toxicity. 
but we should do more worldwide studies to actually to, to understand this spatial temporal distribution and to further confirm its health relevance in based on the toxicological and epidemiological studies. And I think I yeah I still have time to further questions. Um, thank you. Okay, Professor Verma. So thank you so much for such an excellent and very informative talk. Although I work in this particular field, but I honestly say that I also learned many things from your talk. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Neeraj. Thank so you, sir. Yes, the talk was very interesting. So obviously there will be many questions. So what I would request to the audience that please raise your hand and I will call one by one and then you can ask the question. If you have any problem in asking, then you can type the question. Then I will read it out for you. So, okay. So one can raise the hand. I also have a few questions, but then I, I will ask in the last. Okay. I so, see, yeah. yeah. So KG, I, I don't know the full form. Yeah, please ask. Please unmute yourself and ask. Dr. Joshi, please allow people to unmute themselves. Yeah, just just take it, doing that. Yeah. Okay, I think they, they wrote the question. So I saw the question in the chat. Okay, I think there's a question from Dhananjay Kumar. Yeah. Dr. Verma, this is uh, Dr. Dhananjay from Space Physics Laboratory, VSSC, Trivandrum. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes I can hear please continue. Yeah, so uh, as uh, we know that uh, secondary organic aerosols uh, contribution is much more as uh, we have seen from some recent studies. So, uh, if you will uh, see, of course, it is important for the climate perspective also. So, if you will compare uh, this uh, primary organic aerosols and the secondary organic aerosols, uh, what do you feel which uh, contributes most to more to this uh, uh, reactive oxygen species? Yeah, very good question, uh, Dr. Kumar. So, uh, um, you know, so the the ROS activity is primarily linked with the chemical composition. Now, um, this question, which which aerosol, either primary or secondary organic aerosol, contribute more, more to the ROS? Yeah. It depends upon where the SOA is coming from or the POA coming from. What we have seen that if the primary organic aerosol coming directly from the the that burning of the biomass, such as like you know wildfires, it itself is very toxic. Like it's, it is still have very high ROS activity because it basically contains a lots of lots of aromatic substances which are like you know oxidized um so um in that case primary organic aerosol probably will have very high activity itself like you know ros activity mm -hmm. but um if the the uh iso is coming from like vehicles like you know it basically turn into it becomes oxidized in the atmosphere then it actually have more ros activity um similarly if the iso is coming from the uh, isoprene organic aerosol, such as like, you know, there are lots of pine trees in, in the Southeast US, which basically form this, uh, this bio, biogenic SOA. We didn't see much contribution of that SOA in the ROS activity. So it's the, this, the precursor of the SOA, which I think affect the ROS. Uh, yeah, so it's highly depend on uh, the reason to reasons, like uh, what are the sources of SOA at the particular reason. I have seen in my study in a uh, from Alaska, their forest fire happened and it contributes much more, much more to the SOA. But for yes, some reason, yes. I find like this uh, terrestrial plants or uh, oceanic phytoplankton will contribute. So, okay, yes, so exactly. like a precursor is more important. Uh, what precursor contributing to SOA as compared to the abundance of SOA? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So com exactly. Composition of SOA probably is yes. important. So, what yes, SOA yes. is made up of? Yes. Thank okay. You, so now, KG, can you, KG, I, I don't know the full form, so I'm calling it KG. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please. Everyone KG. in India and good morning, everyone who is abroad. Um, sir, I'm Kamlika Gupta. I'm a PhD student with uh, in IIT Bombay and I work with uh, Professor Harish Valeria. 
Our lab uh, is uh, has been working on oxidative potential assays, mostly acellular assays, the DTT and the ascorbate assays for the last couple of years. And um, uh, what we always, uh, when we are also presenting our work, we always mention that uh, ascorbic, uh, these two assays should be the, you know, the way to go when the new regulations are developed. But what I want to know from you is how do you see the research in oxidative potential developing? Like, do you see a more, foc more focus on acellular assays or more focus on cellular assays with respect to regulations once they do change? Sure. Um, I think we are far from the regulations because I think the, um, <laughs> like, it's, it's difficult to actually put that into, into the regulations that, you know, the oxidative potential because the, there is there there are not consensus which assays actually more relevant. I mean there are advantages of these different assays. For example, like you know the acellular assays are quick. Like you know they are like they are high throughput assays. We can actually we have developed the the instrument to measure the acellular assay. They are like you know they they can be the turnaround time is very quick. Like you know one hour like or, or so. Like you know cellular assays are time consuming. Uh, so. Um, I think there has to be first consensus which is most biologically relevant and second thing is that maybe we should use different approach like you know the acellular assays can be used as a screening up approach like you know the uh, the uh, to basically screen out the the pm samples which have probably some response in the health affairs like you know and then the 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 samples which show some effects like you know which are screened out based on the acellular assays they can be further uh, analyzed further, like, you know, looked into for the cellular method. Uh, so I will say that as of now, we should basically try to actually incorporate we, uh, these assays in the epidemiological studies, clinical studies to see mm -hmm. which of these assays actually explain the health effects most uh, representative manner. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so now Dr. Manoranjan, he has raised the hand. Dr. Manoranjan? Okay, thank you so much. Hey, Vishal, nice to see you. And uh, yeah, nice right. to see you, Manoranjan. Hey, nice to see you after a long time. So, I, yeah, I, I, thank you. I joined after a few minutes, so I missed the, some initial part, but uh, really interesting thing. Uh, so, okay. now my question is a couple of questions, small questions. So, yeah. so have you got a chance to compare? Uh, the ROS activity with the real cell lining test and how they are correlated. Uh, do you find a similar trend? Yes, we we have so we measure ROS both in the cell, okay, as well as in the um, in the chemical method, like you know, which is a cell method. Okay. And what we have found that in the cellular response. So this is actually let me just show you that this the slide which I like you know probably you missed that slide. When we measure the cell death rate, like you know the the mortality of the cell, we found very uh, high correlation. Um, yeah, this slide. Can you see this slide? Um, yeah, we basically found out that the cell viability was consistently correlated with the ROS response in the cell itself. Meaning, what is killing the cell is the ROS generation in the cell, which is catalyzed by the PM. Now, your question is. Is that ROS response in the cell is also correlated with the acellular methods? Correct. Yes or no? Actually, sometimes we see correlation, sometimes we don't see because we know that in the acellular method. So I think that the thing is that in the cellular method of ROS generation, many of the processes actually combine together to, to yield the generation of ROS. While in the acellular method, we are not simul simulating all those processes simultaneously. Most of the time, this acellular method are simulating one chemical reaction in which there is a involvement of one class of compounds, like such as the DTT acid, basically simulates the generation of the superoxide radical by the uh, organic compound. In the ascorbic acid, it's, a, it's the, uh, the involvement of the uh, copper or iron for the generation of the hydroxide radical. Like, you know, so we are basically simulating this individual reaction in the chemical assays. What we need is a is a chemical assays which actually simulate all these processes occurring in the cell in a single chemical assay. And we have not, we are not there yet. So that's why I think the question from KG 
also i mean uh, uh, i think that the thing is that chemical assays are good for screening cellular assays are basically good for further understanding the the whole process of the the ro estimation right so another important point come to my mind when you put these particles for a uh, cellular assays their characteristics changes significantly will change significantly based on my study on nanoparticles putting into the solution right they can form aggregates they can form bigger size particle and they will no more be same particles the way you have collected from the ambient condition yes right? yes yes so then that will significantly alter the chemistry inside right yes yeah, yeah. This, this is what one important thing we found out during my phd study we are doing similar study with guntur overduster you must be knowing the guy who has doing tech toxicity study yeah, yeah. so yeah. i think yeah uh, I, i think for the ambient particle um this uh like you know you, we have to consider the 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 difference in the ambient particle versus the nanoparticles because you know when you actually study the nanoparticles those are mostly non soluble right like like the gold dust particle or like you know these are mostly non soluble right. particles so that the way the cell actually interact with this particle is different than the ambient particle we look at the ambient particles right most of it are actually soluble like you know mm-hmm. um like major fraction of this ambient particles nitrate sulfate organics like you know these are soluble a very small fraction is no, is non soluble now when we inhale these particles like they are first intercepted by like this lung li- lung lining fluid which is actually solubilizes most of these particles so what our cells are actually exposed to is mostly a soluble fraction it's it's very different from the nanoparticle which is mostly in insoluble uh i agree that there is a insoluble component which actually can behave differently right but i think a one to one comparison of the nanoparticles with the ambient particle is not properly appropriate like you know yes yes um, i agree definitely would not be compare but the i'm saying the methodology might be yeah their approach right? i agree yeah but i think the point is that even if they they change the the physiology of the cells mm-hmm. uh is is biologically relevant because the that's a way these particles are intercepted by the cells and if they are changing in our in the in this extra cellular uh like in the extra body incubation the same way they are actually are exposed in this in the body itself right you know it's just that they some of it actually can become solubilized and then some intercepts the cells directly isn't it so yeah Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Manoj. So, Doctor Amit Kumar. So, I am going in order. So, next I will come to you, Doctor Zaha. Thank you, Doctor Amit Kumar. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. You are muted. My huh? okay, my fine. question is will be more general because I am not expert of this field. So, no whatever the relation, the linear concentration response relation, it is uh, maybe it is generated from the observation and it may be the observation whatever the observation made it may be the locally locally or country and it will be very not only country wise it will within the country like india yes. if you see the north yes. india south india and middle india and in indo gangetic plain the pollution concentration and as well as the maybe source is entirely different so one correlation which is for the universal make for the world it may be not appropriate so we need to have a relation or the lean, uh, this response lean, this relation for the country itself and maybe the region wise also absolutely dr kumar and that's exactly what i i uh, like you know is the first point of my conclusion that uh, you are absolutely right that there has to be region specific uh, like concentration response function because you are right the, the the aerosol composition changes from region to region and yes. like you know it cannot be for the whole country it cannot be for the whole like, as of now what we have is a global curve like you know which we are basically applying yes. it everywhere and then predicting this very high number of you know people dying in india i think these are these are wrong estimates and they could be wrong by a very large factor like you know uh, because we see that the composition changes intensity toxicity of the particle changes 
um, we should develop this region specific curve. But my, the point is that these the developing development of these curves take time. Like you know, they have to conduct this large scale cohort studies for years. Like you know, and uh, so you are absolutely right that you know. Um, I mean, till that, what should we do? <laughs> and that's where I say that, you know, maybe we should yeah, use yeah. these NPC. Okay, uh, Dr. Saha, you are raising the hand. Dr. Saha. Yes, uh, thank you, Bashal. It was a wonderful uh, presentation by you. And I got my uh, yeah, answer Saha. in the last concluding lines <laughs> that uh, most of the uh, aerosols are soluble in nature and is not going to cause major harm in the within the human body. This is the on the other hand, I would like to uh, I would like to add that all these secondary articles are the micro micronutrients for the plants. That's why the plants growth in India in, in a tropical belt anywhere and everywhere. That is a that is an advantageous position. The, the other, other thing aspect is that we should have the region specific standards. But uh, so this is agreed by all. And we are going to have we are going to revise the air quality standard because I serve and regulator the organization, not a particular the research organization. How to add this component in our standard? That is uh, the one simple question to you. How to add this, address these issues in our regulatory standard nationwide or nationwide? What is, would be your suggestion, Vishal? Please. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I would I would just correct myself if, if it is not clear. I think I don't mean to say that this soluble component of the particle is not harmful. It is harmful, actually, because the soluble component contains these pHs and metals, which is taken up by the cells and cause harm. Uh, what I'm saying is that that the mechanism of this soluble component for the toxicity could be different than the insoluble component, uh, the way the cell interact with them. And the second question is, I think your, uh, I mean, your second question is about the how do we uh, these region specific standards. Honestly, I don't think we are there that we can actually like you know develop the the standards like the region specific standards. What I mean to say is that we acknowledge that, that the intrinsic toxicity of the particles is different in different regions. And what does that tell me? that we should do the cohort studies for different regions and based on because you know if you look at the the national ambient air quality standards both in us and india they were developed from the cohort studies i mean the the studies like harvard six six cities studies were conducted in 1990s you know to to basically come up with these numbers of 15 microgram per meter cube of air in the us uh, right and then similarly india like you know adopted th those standards but then they were taken from the large scale cohort studies right um, now what i'm saying is that that in these different like different regions could have this different threshold of the pm 2.5 mass uh, which are toxic to the humans so maybe we should do actually these different cohort studies in different regions and until then we can actually like you know what we can do is we can incorporate this oxidative potential in the toxic in more worldwide studies or epidemiological studies to understand how does this, you know, uh, PM 2.5 actually vary across different regions to to basically get some idea about, okay, that, that do the PM 2.5 mass and toxicity vary together. So I don't think that, you know, honestly, that like we can actually incorporate this toxicity into the standard right away, uh, but we should better understand their mechanism in more worldwide studies before we, we leave to that consensus. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. So, anyone else? My, Dr. Raj Kishore. Yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Kishore. Yeah, so there is one question that when we consider the health impact of air pollution on admission into hospital, Basically, we are not able to differentiate whether it is the a biological component or the biological component of the air which is responsible or landing the patient into hospital, which is more contributory and where is the demarcation line as which component is affecting more leading to the hospital admission of the such patients, especially patients suffering from respiratory illnesses. 
so do we have any assay for that or uh, any right. sorry i'll if i understand the question correctly uh, like when you say biological and a biological component do you mean to say that the uh, the like the bio aerosol such as the viruses or bacteria in the air yes, yes, or is it yes yeah when i mean to say sir bi uh, biological component that is uh, bio aerosols which i am talking about oh okay i see yeah um <laughs> um yeah i mean these assays don't measure the bio aerosols honestly like you know like this chemical like this the dtt assay or the R, the cellular ros assay they don't measure the the, the contribution of the bio aerosols uh, there are different assays i think that's a different stream like you know be, be, i mean um i think i will say that you know this bio aerosol measurement is, is entirely different meaning that you basically have to measure the the concentration of the viruses and bacteria and they i think they they turn into infections rather than this chronic effect i mean those those effects are generally acute these are these chemical components of the particles they result into more chronic effects so um uh yeah i don't sorry i don't have a clear answer to that question like i don't think we actually have a demarcation for but I, as i can tell you that these assays are more geared towards the the a biological component which result into biological effects but not caused by the biological component of the aerosols uh, there is one thing sir which i think uh, that this uh, non biological or a biological component although they lead to like chronic diseases which cannot be diagnosed within one or two years like if patient develop uh, lung cancer uh, but that will take time but in case during winter season or when the environment uh, air aqi goes up we see patient coming to respiratory opd and admission to hospital but uh, is it only the biological or not that is basically while assessing the clinical profile or health impact of air pollution i think without considering the biological component of the air uh, it will be one sided i think uh, when we talk only about the non biological component especially mm -hmm. when it relates to health impact yeah yeah i think that's a good point you are right that maybe uh uh i i understand your point that you know that this bio aerosols could also be inducing these effects and how to differentiate the, these right yes, yes, um sir. yeah i think that's that's a good point and i i i can tell you that as of now these assays don't differentiate uh between yes. the two um but there is something maybe yeah we should consider that like you know if if there is a role of this bio aerosols also in these assays and how we can actually separate those effects so thank you for this for the suggestion here yeah thank you sir thank you thank you for the anyone, anyone else can i add something to this point yeah please so there is a paper by samake et al in scientific reports and they have measured the on expected role of bio sorry, i am not able to see the name uh, i am speaking i am anil patel oh anil yeah <laughs> so so there is a paper uh, by samak et al in 2017 and it was published in scientific reports and they have found that the bio aerosol can be a cause for the oxidative stress also but oh, okay. the 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 oxidative stress like oxidative potential was not that much higher as compared to the organics and the other Uh, metal compounds so yeah there is a one paper only till now published on the biosols role on the oxidative potential and i have i have provided the doi for that paper in the in the chat okay yeah thank you anil i think i have seen that paper but i didn't don't remember didn't remember it somehow like okay. you know Fine. yeah okay thank so you this thank is you the anil, only yeah. paper which talked yeah. about biosols any anyone else uh, uh, i not, also so have one ask... question I also have one question. Yeah. Okay. Please. So, Vishal. Uh, yeah, yes. Sure. So, uh, sir, you used uh, the traditional method of DTT during your pioneer research in 2010, right? Or 2012? Which method? Sorry. Which method uh, did you say? The traditional DTT method. Yeah. Traditional. Yeah. 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 With the TCA and EDTA, all all these chemicals. But later on, you you developed your online system for the yeah. DTT measurement, and which which is kind of modified version of the DTT. Do you yeah. think the 
the output of the of the the of the oxidative potential from the ambient aerosols is not like majorly different if you measure with the modified version or the traditional version of the DTT. No, we didn't see any difference. Actually, we removed those steps of TCA and EDTA because they were actually, you know, when we were measuring it in the offline fashion, we, we were doing the reaction, the DTT reaction, and then the DTT NB requires some time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's between that, we actually have to quench the reaction by adding TCA. Now, in the online method, we don't, we don't require that time. Like, you know, like, because we are doing, like, as the reaction is complete, we add the DT, DT and B it, itself. So DCA was required to quench the reaction. Since we don't have, we don't require that time delay, we can actually, as the, whenever we want to stop the reaction, we directly add DT and B, like, you know. Yes. So we have seen that they, it basically show, it, it, it caused no uh, difference in the, in the final output of the DTT assay, DTT activity. Yes. Hmm. yes. Removing both of those steps, EDT and, and uh, yeah. DCA. Okay. Yeah, so this is what I used in my PSD also, the modified version. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah, you. yeah. Okay. So anyone else? Okay. So next question is by Dr. Nidhi Rastogi. <laughs> so Vishal, I will have just just two questions. I will not go in many things. So one thing yeah. is when we talk about this antagonistic and the synergistic effect, and the studies which are shown. Say, for example, you have taken PQ and plus metal or something, some other things. So two known components you have taken and you have seen the mixture, effect of mixture and individual. Right. So doing offline, taking a specific species is one thing. And when the same thing is present in ambient aerosol, along with many other species, which we don't know. So right. do you expect their effect will be similar in real aerosol versus uh, lab aerosol? Is where we are at for that. Yeah. Moment. Yes, that's a very good question, Neeraj. The answer is we don't know. Like, you know, and this is something which we are exploring. I mean, I think the objective of showing this interaction is that that previously, for example, as I mentioned that, you know, the, the, the researcher from UC Davis, they basically measured the, the, the intrinsic activity of copper, iron, you know, quinone separately. And then to show the contribution of these different species in the overall activity of the PM, they just multiply the, the intrinsic activity with the total, with the concentration of these species to come up with the contribution of these different species in the overall PM, right? Mm. Uh, and there have been many groups, they, they were using the same approach. That That is wrong approach because I think the, the objective is to show that there are interactions. Now, do these interactions remain similar when they are actually present in the whole mixture of the PM, when there is other species also? Yeah, We don't know. But the but the point is that if there are synergistic interaction in in the binary mixture, synergistic or antagonistic interaction in the binary mixture, there could be more interactive effect in the total mixture as well. And this is something which we are exploring right now. What like you know one of my student is working on by like stepping like you know basically from binary to tertiary mixture, from tertiary to quaternary, and then the whole mixture. And then basically we are developing a machine learning model. To, to come up with the whole activity of the particle, like, you know, as a function of these different chemical components. So your, your question is very, is, is prop is very appropriate, but yes, we don't know, but I think there are going to be some. It is in initial stages when yes. people are trying to understand yes. right yes. now, but it will take time. Yes. Okay. Yes. Other question is related to say, whenever we are, I'm also involved in that. Huh? So I'm asking the question to myself also. <laughs> Yeah. Whenever we are doing PM 10 or PM 2.5, we know that all the particles smaller than that size are there. So if we correct size segregated, because mm -hmm. when we have all the particles, so sometimes there is a, you know, uh, kind of, you know, artifact means, but in one of paper, our paper, we have shown that. So if you have DTE inactive species too much, so that will tend to show that you have negative effect, but actually it is not because since you have something, some mass, which is totally DTT, DTT or whatever, as we are talking about inactive. Right. So that right. will show you different kind of uh, trend, right. which is actually not true. But if right. we do size segregated sampling, uh, and once we do size segregation, so at least source size also we categorize. Right. So it will not be as obviously it will not be the best thing, but it may be better yeah. than the if we are doing PM ten versus PM two point five or so. What What do you think? Right. 
Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea because you're absolutely right. We have sometimes seen a negative correlation of sulfate with DDT. With DDT. Right. That doesn't make any sense. Right. I mean, that's not, it cannot be that DDT actually suppresses the DDT activity. Right. It's just that when we have very high fraction of sulfate, that basically means that the act, the components which are active in the DDT assays are reduced. Right. And that's why we have this, like, I think there are, there are two ways we can actually handle this, this, this thing, this problem. I think if we do the volume normalized correlation, that negative correlation probably will be somewhat sub, like you know is is hit, should, will not be shown because uh, because I think that ma like this this approach like you know that if the the fraction of one component increases the other decreases basically on the mass fraction like you know mass based fraction in the volume normalized it it won't be like that but I think the, what you are proposing is I uh, is another approach that this this uh, uh, like you know this fraction one increasing fraction increasing and another decreasing will be more in the pm10 if you just take the small like you know the small size particle that effect won't be shown there like you know so you're right that i think if we actually do the size segregated correlation yeah then it will so be we, we have shown in one of our paper we have shown in the lab we have shown that sulfate mm -hmm. nitrate ammonium they are actually DDT inactive so if you have too much concentration of yes. the species in pm so that will tend to show yeah. that you have negative correlation which is not true yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I, we have seen that also in, in, yeah, in many countries, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if there is no other question, then I would request Dr. Shani Diwari to give the vote of thanks. Dr. Shani? Uh, excuse me, Dr. Neeraj, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, question? yeah, please, please. You would have raised the hand, or I would have called you. Please, please. Yeah. I actually, I didn't find the yeah. sign, actually. So I was traveling, so I could not hear properly, but uh, my question is, uh, what was the duration of the of your study exposure duration and uh, what is the source of pm 2.5 just a quick question okay yeah so yeah. the duration in most of this chemical and the cellular assays were as one hour like we mm -hmm. uh, we incubate okay. the, the sorry for the in, for the chemical assays it was one hour for the cellular assays it basically varies from one hour to 24 hours like when we measure the chronic death like the death of the mm -hmm. cell we measure it in, within 24 hours when we measure the ROS, we measure it either in one hour or 24 hour itself. Um, okay, and yeah. And what the, the was the source, time uh, Time, like that's a duration. Sorry, I, what's that, what, what, what do you this mean by the, the time period? Exposure duration and uh, what was the da data? The mean sample size. What was the sample size? Oh, yeah. um, so like the sample size is shown in the is individual uh, data I show, like, you know, the, the the figure I showed you. So, for example, for uh, relating with these, that. yeah. So, I think for uh, in most of the cases, the sample size was more than fifty. So, like yeah. for example, the, when we conducted this Midwest sampling campaign, at each site we we collected fifty two samples. Like you know, uh, I think the data which I showed from worldwide studies, there were I, at each. I mean, there were the data varied from. Um, 20 to like 250 samples like you know and when we put all the data together it was basically 450 samples like you know okay. uh, and then yeah the sources for all these particles was ambient particles like collected from the ambient air okay okay so uh, thank you dr vishal it was fantastic and to yeah. out many questions so sure. and uh, well, another comment so is that it is not necessary we include biological um, agents into these non-biological so this is separate study and many congratulations for that thank you thank you, thank you dr pandya yeah. okay anyone else let me ask if, you know people have not raising hand anyone else <laughs> okay no so dr shani Devari, i request you to give the vote of thanks okay am i audible yeah can you put on your camera just wait Yes. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, on, it's a really great talk, uh, Dr. Vishal Verma. It's a very interesting. Even I don't know so much about the ROS and the uh, oxidative potential studies of aerosols, but it's quite interesting to understand the, how aerosol impact our health system. So on behalf of all ISTA family, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitations to give a lecture under the umbrella of aerosol uh, ISTA monthly lecture series. 
so thank you for the same uh, i also thanks the to dr neeraj rastogi vice president of the aista india dr manish joshi and all executive member for their endless efforts to organize this uh, monthly lecture series smoothly since last uh eight months it's a monthly monthly lecture series uh, one lectures in every month and finally i would also thanks to all the attendees who showing their interest in this lecture and uh, actively participate in uh, question answer series uh, of this lecture that's really motivate us to work on this and continuation for the monthly lecture series so thank you all for the your participation also thank you okay just let me one say one thing for the information of all so this lecture is recorded and it will be available on our astra channel so if you have missed some part or something or if you want to see it again i will see it again so you can always go to our astra uh, youtube channel and see that thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you so much thank you yeah thank you so much sir uh, neeraj and manish for inviting me and really i'm like i i felt really great i would i didn't expect such an interactive question answer session which basically made me so like you know motivated to like you know give this talk so thank you so much again for inviting me and having me present my work on this forum thank you so much again thank, thank, thank you thank you everyone and have a nice evening thank you bye thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.